So thank you everybody for joining. My name is Jenna Gibson. If you don't know, I'm a member of the FOK board of directors and I'm really excited to be hosting this second uh, webinar in our series. Um, we're really happy to have everybody here and we're happy to be able to talk to you even though we're going through this you know, pandemic situation. Um, I want to um, first start off introducing Victoria Kim who is our speaker for tonight. Um, she is the sole correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. Um, she joined the paper in 2007, and since then she has covered state and federal courts, worked on investigative projects, and um, reported on South Southern California's Korean community. Um, she has previously written for the Associated Press out of South Korea and West Africa, and for the Financial Times in New York. Um, she was raised in Seoul and graduated from Harvard University with a degree in history. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Victoria, and we're really excited to hear about your work um, covering Korea during this time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, to start off, I kind of want to start with a little bit of a general question. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process of tracking down stories um, in Seoul and how that might have changed during the COVID pandemic? Um, well, it, it's, I think it's been a bizarre time for everybody. Everybody's work has been turned upside down. Um, and I think that was major, majorly so for journalists who a big part of what we do is we go out and talk to people and meet people and interact with people um, and sort of, sort of learn about what's going on in a place through that. And in, in some ways, um, South Korea was, you know, in hindsight and relatively speaking, so uh, much less um, impacted uh, relative to, you know, colleagues of mine in the U.S. Um, a, a few of my um, colleagues in the U.S. have been diagnosed with the coronavirus and they've, they've written about that experience and all the precautions that they've, they've had to take because of the prevalence. Whereas here, um, it, there was a, a period in February when um, South Korea was the largest cluster outside of China. Um, and it was um, getting to a point where um, there, there was a lot of fear there, you know, when the cases were surging in Tegu, it was um, at its peak, it was 900 cases a day, which, you know, in, in hindsight, relative to the rest of the world doesn't seem like much, but at the time it was, um, it did sort of uh, lead to a lot of uh, discussions and uh, wondering if there would need to be a Wuhan style of lockdown, how, how South Korea was going to deal with this. And in, 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 in many ways, South Korea was the first one outside of China to, to have to deal with this question of um, what is what are the parameters of, our, uh, of this government's um, pandemic response when um, China was the only precedent um, that existed. And it was, it's a you know, very di different type of society. Um, and in terms of how I find my stories, I think um, I'm a Metro reporter by background. I spent um, a decade uh, reporting in Los Angeles um, where uh, you know, a lot of um, the reporting that we do um, is, is boots on the ground. It's, it's um, going to the street corner where something happened, going and spending time in a community. Um, and I think even as a foreign correspondent, that is very much um, in, in my DNA, I think when it comes to foreign reporting, there is there are a lot of think tanks, there are a lot of reports, there are a lot of experts. Um, but my uh, preferred method is to to go um, meet the people involved and and spend time on the ground. Um, so I like to do that as much as possible. And, and this year, for the most part, it it has been tougher, but not impossible in South Korea because of how um, how the country has dealt with the pandemic. Um, and I have been able to move around the country a bit and, and sort of get to meet people. Um, and I, I think it's been uh, tougher for my colleagues in other countries around Asia. There have been a lot of um, travel restrictions and things like that. Um, but in, in, uh, in terms of reporting out of Korea this year, so much of it has been about the coronavirus and there was so much attention on the country because of its pandemic response. And I do think that was, um, uh, that felt pretty major to the general South Korean public and, and to the South Korean government in terms of um, just how much the world was looking towards South Korea for how it dealt with the pandemic. So I think you found some really fascinating stories 
by doing that. And you found some really fascinating people, especially um, like you reported on an 85 year old barber or farmers, migrant laborers. Um, what drew you to some of these stories or some of these people? Um, I, I think it is that, you know, I, I, I think it's the same thing that hopefully gets that gets um, my, you know, gets the readers reading the stories that um, when I do write them, that it's, um, it's, uh, you know, people who um, are living the day to day of this place um, and are having experiences that that teach us something about um, this place, this time, um, and what's going on and, and, um, you know, the, um, the, the barber who I, she's a, um, I, she was an 85 year old uh, female barber who was the first person, first woman in South Korea to officially become a barber and to pass the test. Um, I think about 50 years ago um, to, to become the first female barber. And she, she's been essentially cutting um, hair, men's hair since the Korean war. Um, and she's, you know, she's lived through so much, she's seen so much, um, and she's experienced so much that, that her, her perspective um, on the pandemic or what, what's going on, on now um, was, was fascinating. And she's uh, just, her life story was interesting also, but also it's sort of the current moment through her eyes that I, that I found um, interesting. And it, it was the same thing with the, the migrant farm workers that, um, that this is something that is, um, in many ways, so universal, the question of how food is produced that we eat and something that's um, in pandemic times has really sort of hit home for a bunch of societies around the world, how um, a lot of the food is, uh, the fields are worked on by people who have migrated from um, other countries, you know, less well-off countries. So um, from Central and South America to North America, from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, and with that flow um, interrupted by the pandemic, it just uh, it teaches us, or it sort of makes clear just how reliant we are um, on that supply. Um, so I wanted to go spend some time with um, uh, both the the farmer who um, was running this farm and the migrant workers who had come from Thailand. Um, I didn't know before I showed up that they were going to be migrants from Thailand because um, it's sort of uh, it's a it's a day you know, day labor kind of situation where each day it's somebody else that comes through. Um, and so the farmer told me before I showed up, it's like, they could be from Thailand, they could be from Vietnam. Um, I, we don't know yet, um, which was a bit tricky for me linguistically because I speak neither and I couldn't really prepare um, to go with a translator. Uh, but after, you know, it, there, there was some that we, some things, some communication I could do through Google Translate earlier in the day. And then once I found a translator over the phone who was in Thailand, she helped me um, sort of interview them and get a sense of what uh, what their experience working in Korea was and what um, how that had been impacted um, by the pandemic. So, yeah. so with some of these stories, either these ones or, or any others that you've reported recently, are there any like particular moments or episodes that have stuck with you um, from reporting on those stories? Um, let's see, it's it's been um, it's been such like uh, sort of disparate little pockets of um, a global experience, and I think that's been. Um, Sort of interesting to go through because in some ways it's so universal what the entire world is going through and at the same time um, it was it's been so different being in South Korea and experiencing it um, in South Korea and even within South Korea depending on where you are or who you are um, it's it's been so different I think um, for example with the with the barber her her age um, and her perspective made it so different from say, you know, a lot of the people that um, I spoke to a lot of small business owners whose lives have really been um, turned upside down. Um, and they're, you know, they, they are forced to think of um, take everything a, a month at a time, whenever rent comes due, when, when bills come due. Um, and, and yet for, for her, it's a, you know, whole different time scale of things. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, so I guess it's the, 
disparateness of people's experiences that have been um, interesting and uh, and that in, in such a universal moment that we're experiencing, um, it's so different. And I think it's also, um, I wrote a, sort of a story slash essay earlier this year about, um, about the social distancing and, and the isolation that um, when the pandemic was still in its early days in South Korea um, in March, when it sort of did feel like before the rest of the world had gone into as much of a lockdown, um, that it felt more like a South Korea experience. And it sort of made me think about um, to what extent South Korea um, is sort of was ideally set up for this existence where you can order everything on delivery. There are a lot of things that you can do over the internet and over the phone. Um, and that uh, we're already in a society where, um, where so much of our time is spent, um, you know, watching uh, endless streaming content. Um, and in many ways, I think South Korea was um, further along in that isolation, um, digital isolation than a lot of places were. Um, and that in many ways made it uh, well suited in a sad way um, for this world. And I think this pandemic is going to sort of accelerate a lot of things that were already um, in progress. So I'm curious, you are reporting from Seoul, but you're writing for an American audience, for an audience in LA, right? How do you approach your reporting in a way that is you know telling stories from Seoul but making them accessible to your audience in the US? I think that's something that's probably a bit different for me than um, sort of traditional foreign correspondence that I think there, there was a time when being a foreign correspondent meant you were sort of translating or um, adjusting or you know digesting what's going on in a foreign country and making it relevant to um, your home audience. And I, and I think in many ways that's majorly changing in that um, we are a, a very globally connected world that it is possible to know what's going on, um, sort of see, hear directly from people who are impacted by something halfway around the world on Twitter or on social media. Um, so I think in many ways it, it feels like I, I do a lot less of um, trying to make um you know make my stories accessible to a home audience or just but and just tell tell human stories as they are and that we that um i think a lot of uh, readers connect with them because because we're all human and we're living in this world and i think there's less of a need to try to um, bridge that gap in a way that there used to be um, in the past um, and I think, uh, you know, I think the pandemic was a, a good reminder of that, that um, that something that's happening in, on one part of the world just in a matter of a couple of weeks, um, you know, hits home in a major way. And, and in many ways, maybe it didn't it, it didn't hit home as quickly as it should have, because I remember having a conversation um, in February. I think it was when Kobe died about, um, you know, there was a pandemic going on or uh, epidemic at the time um, starting to brew in Asia um, and, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant's death in Los Angeles, which is major news for the city and major news for, for California. Um, and and uh, sort of there was parallels. And at the, at the moment, I think because of all that was going on in the US, the pandemic was um, very much, uh, out of mind or not at, as much of a um, interest to some of the local audiences. Um, and yet it so quickly became a local story um, and a universal one very quickly. So speaking of COVID and pandemic responses, you've written several pieces on Korea's contract tracing, contract tracing efforts, um, but also about some people who have kind of fallen through the cracks during this crisis. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Korea has handled the COVID pandemic and, and what they're doing for those people who may be a little bit you know, less accessible or may be having a, a tougher time right now? Um, so the, what South Korea, um, how South Korea dealt with the um, 
pandemic was largely informed by its experience with the 2015 um, MERS outbreak, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which was another coronavirus. Um, and there were um, a lot of legal changes, a lot of um, systematic changes that were put in place at the time because um, South Korea felt uh, there, there was major public panic. And um, at the time, there were a couple hundred infections and 38 deaths, which in the in, in hindsight, compared to the coronavirus pandemic seems um, trivial, but at the time, I think it, it was a pretty major crisis and there was a genuine sense of fear among the public. Um, and a, a big uh, part of that um, panic at the time had to do with not knowing where the cases were. So um, those infections were uh, hospital-based, but people didn't know. Initially, it wasn't disclosed which hospitals the infections were happening at and which how many cases were where. Um, and there was a, a sense that um, the government wasn't being as transparent as it could. Um, and another part of that was um, there was a shortage of tests. So it, it took quite a bit of time to confirm whether, um, some it, I think for the first death it happened posthumously that it was confirmed that it was a MERS case. So it took um, time because there was a bottleneck and all the cases had to go be tested by the CDC. So there were legal changes made so that the um, testing kit production could be sped up and that, um, and this time around, um, South Korea very early on was um, very transparent, if in, in many ways a bit too transparent, too forthcoming with every bit of information about who was being impacted, um, how many people were being impacted, um, and some that really, you know, could, uh, did, um, appear to infringe on people's privacies, where people lived, um, what their professions were, information that wasn't necessarily relevant to, um, to public health and that there's been sort of adjustment for that uh, going forward. Um, so that, so South Korea really, really early on ramped up its production of testing kits and um, had a very meticulous contact tracing regime that involved and, and it was enabled by the laws that um, came out of uh, the MERS outbreak in that um, the government here is able to access um, credit card data, CCTV data, cell tower data, um, in, in, in things that in many ways may not be accepted by the public in a lot of places. Um, and some of the contact tracers were telling me that earlier on it took about half a day for them to get, half a day to a day to get this information they would requested um, from um, from the authorities or the credit card company. And eventually they made it, um, they've made it so that it's pretty much instantaneous. So as soon as they know that, you know, like I have the coronavirus, they can go through my um, credit card data to see where I've been, um, cell tower data and stuff like that. And, and some of that has really run into um, issues like uh, in May, there was a outbreak, um, a cluster of cases that started um, with some clubs uh, in a popular area here called Itaewon. Um, and some of the clubs that were the center of the outbreak were um, uh, gay clubs. Um, and it's still a society that is not particularly, um, not, um, not across the board accepting of being LGBT and uh, sort of being associated with that cluster um, would have had the effect of outing people um, professionally and to, uh, to their families. Um, and that sort of drove home what the cost of South Korea's contact tracing regime was. Um, and I do think that led to some adjustments and um, some you know, measures like the government allowing for anonymous testing um, and things like that. In terms of people who have fallen through the cracks, um, I think this is you know, something that's also happened in the US in terms of um, sort of realizing who the essential workers are who don't the people who don't have the option of um, staying home. Um, a lot of people who are institutionalized, um, I, there's a current case that's um, breaking out uh, in, in an institution in Busan. So um, a lot of, uh, you know, nursing, they're called nursing hospitals here, which is uh, a little bit different from nursing homes, but there have been a lot of outbreaks at those. Um, so mental health institutions, there was um, one of the early, possibly the earliest outbreak um, was a, a locked men's, mental ward in a hospital in near Daegu um, and something like 100 out of 102 patients there um, ended up being infected by the coronavirus and that's where the first death came from. Um, so uh, in terms of 
what's what the government is doing to assist those. I, I can't really, I haven't reported on it recently, so I can't really speak to that, but I do think um, it's led to a lot of sort of soul searching of where are the vulnerabilities. Um, and and um, that's also been, and it's, you know, aside from people who've been institutionalized, sort of seeing that the, there were outbreaks at um, call centers and uh, distribution centers of people who were working extra um, because of the demand and delivery. And then there are some people who were impacted who were um, working delivery during the week and then working at call centers over the weekend. So people um, who really didn't have the choice to stay at home and to socially distance and keep themselves safe while enabling the rest of us to do so. Um, we, I've been getting a couple of questions sent in the chat, which is great. Um, please continue to send those. I'm going to ask Victoria two more questions and then we'll move on to some audience questions. Um, I'm very curious how the Korean media has covered the COVID pandemic in the U.S., given that, you know, we, Korea had this experience, they maybe learned from this experience, and then, you know, it moved into the other parts of the world, including the U.S. Um, what has been kind of that response like? I think the response here, as with the rest of the world, has just been shock. Um, and uh, there, earlier on, when I was researching how, how South Korea's um, system had been set up, disease response system had been set up after the MERS outbreak, um, I saw, uh, so one of the things that enabled um, the testing kits to be produced so rapidly was a law that's called the Emergency Use Authorization Act. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, it, the, the test kits that are um, manufactured, it usually takes about a year to get approved, but they were able to do it. Um, it's, it's an emergency use. So in a situation, it's not, um, it doesn't go through the, the meticulous type of testing that it would typically go through, but it speeds it up because it's for use in an emergency situation. And when South Korea was setting up its law, it looked to what the US had, because the US already had an emergency use authorization um, procedure in place. And it looked to you know, what, the, what the CDC does, what the US had done in the past, because you know, I think um, the, the US was always deemed to be at the, you know, um, the model of a lot of things for South Korea <laughs> for a very long time. Um, so I think it's it's been utter shock to to see things unfold and um, in a and on on the flip side I do think it has um, the Korean government has definitely sort of played it up and, and I think some of the public has has um, sort of uh, realized uh, how far I guess South Korea has come it, it, there's been a, a sense of pride. Um, to how well the government has um, managed the crisis in hindsight. Um, I think earlier on there, there was um, some confusion and a lot of uh, panic, but um, as the pandemic has swept through the world, um, I think people have, here have realized just how, um, how majorly we'd, we've dodged or we appear to have dodged so far. Um, what could have been a, a, a what was a very fast brewing process and that um, a couple of decisions could really make a world of difference and be a difference of lots of lives. Yeah, so one last question before I turn it over to um, the audience. Uh, are there any stories that you really would like to cover but haven't been able to yet, either because you just haven't gotten to it or because of like COVID restrictions? I think the with South Korea um, or report most um, reporting out of South Korea, the black box, the the both the draw and the um, puzzle is always going to be North Korea. Um, in that, uh, you know, there some journalists have traveled to North Korea, but it hasn't happened in a long time. Um, North Korea, I think, still their official position is that there have been zero coronavirus cases, except for the one that tried to. Um, one that came from South Korea and he was infected, uh, although there's some dispute about the validity of that. Um, so in terms of like, what is, you know, it, it's it's going to be a tough, it's going to have been a tough year 
for North Korea as much as anybody else, but, but probably more so in North Korea. That is um, that the what little um, trade that was happening has been shut down. Um, there have been bad, there has been bad flooding. It was bad in South Korea, but it's probably worse in North Korea. Um, that there's probably a lot going on there in terms of the people of North Korea. Like we, we hear some of what the regime wants us to see and to hear, but in terms of like what's actually going on in the ground there, it's really tough to know um, and is, is always going to be concerning and frustrating and um, a, a puzzle in terms of how, how that should be covered or how they can be covered. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I have a first question from um, our very own board member, Rob Ichihana. So he asks, um, there's a tremendous focus on the US Supreme Court justice um, ongoing hearing right now and the US presidential election. So what is the kind of view on the street of in Korea of you know, US politics more generally um, besides the coronavirus or is the coronavirus just basically what anyone is talking about right now? Um, I do think the coronavirus is, I mean, you know, the world is waiting with bated breath uh, in terms of what's happening in, in US politics. Um, and I think that's probably also true of um, North and South Korea as well. Um, the Trump administration has been a interesting ride to, for the Korean Peninsula to, to say the least. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there have been a lot of up and downs um, with the North Korean, you know, quote unquote, denuclearization process or any, any progress with diplomacy with, with North Korea. Um, but the, there, you know, there were a lot of hopes hung by um, the, the current president in South Korea and, you know, by North Korea, there were a lot of things that um, happened under the Trump administration. That's that's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, um, and that's going to continue to be true um, pre and post uh, U.S. elections. About uh, in terms of, I think there was a, a sense in some ways that it was, um, you know, that uh, that what the fate of the peninsula it, it is contingent on on um, US presidential politics. Um, so there's that. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, how, how it's um, being viewed on the street, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and I guess a lot of uh, uh, trepidation um, sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that makes sense. Uh... I think um, what, in Rob's question, he, he asks about, you know, this, this daily, like deluge of news, I think in general, <laughs> it can be very anxiety inducing. Um, so next question is from Charles Shillan. Um, is Korea experiencing reverse migration in right now where families who maybe immigrated to the US or other countries are deciding to return and what challenges might they experience? Um, so I can sort of speak anecdotally to a, a friend of mine who um, was living in, she and her husband were living in San Francisco um, and they decided to put everything in storage and come to Korea for a bit. Um, so, and, and there have been a lot of, um, a lot of friends uh, who have, who are Korean American or, you know, who have ties to Korea. Um, who are still working their um, jobs in the US, but from here. Um, because they don't, because they're uh, remote anyways. Um, and, but here uh, people are generally able to go out and sort of lead norm, seemingly normal daily lives. Um, so I, I don't believe there are, really, there are really statistics to say, to actually call it reverse migration, but there, um, I've, anecdotally I've seen it happen quite a bit. Um, or, and it's just the, the relative situation seems so different that um, people are choosing to, to spend their time here. And, and it's, I think for some of them, it means uh, very odd schedules of having to work throughout the night um, for uh, on a you know, US schedule. And at the same time, it, it seems worth it to, um, to be able to sort of just 
especially people with children to be able to go out and um, live, uh, experience the city and, and things like that. Um, in terms of uh, what challenges um, they may face, I guess in, in, in some ways, um, I am a reverse migrant in that I lived in the US for 15 years, then, then came back. Um, I mean, not necessarily uh, permanently, I'm here, here for work, but um, it's, you know, Korea is so much more um, cosmopolitan compared to when I was growing up. And yet still it is a place that I can see um, is still pretty homogenous and is still not um, a, very accepting of um, immigrants. And that is something that I did see during my reporting on the migrant laborers as well. But, um, the demographics of the country are such that it's definitely in need of migrants and a lot of a, like a huge swath of the country wouldn't be able to function. The agricultural sector would not be able to function at all. A lot of the industrial production would not be able to function without immigrants and without migrant workers. Um, and yet the society remains um, not very accommodating to diversity or, or to immigration. So that is something, um, and that's not necessarily a challenge for me, but it, it is something that I've, I guess, um, I noticed um, coming back from a place like Los Angeles. Yeah, so um, Daniel, Daniel Strickland asks about um, rural areas and how our rural areas are handling the pandemic and, and handling this moment right now. Um, so there have been, I think, some villages where there's been a massive outbreak. Well, like massive as, you know, a village with um, some dozens of people and then like dozens of them would be infected um, at a, I think there was one where it was um, the, the village treating its elders to a nice meal and a, there, were, there was an outbreak of cases there. Um, so I think it's really depended on where it is, there's certain pockets that have really been majorly impacted and a lot of pockets that just haven't been impacted at all. It, they've had zero, zero cases um, for being remote. Um, and I, I, the concern I think was always Seoul because of how densely packed it is um, and just how, how many people are in this metropolis and um, that are forced to interact with each other in, in terms of public transit and all the, um, uh, you know, restaurants and things like that. Um, the, the, when I did the reporting on the um, migrant agricultural workers, um, they are experiencing a, a pretty major shortage of farmhands. And I think this is something that's uh, across the board in a lot of places around the world um, where they just didn't have the people to um, do the work that was necessary. Um, and it did sort of reveal the um, structural problems with the, because there there are certain visas that will allow migrant workers to come work here. And yet they're not, they aren't set up to meet the needs of the farm farmers who need just a couple of days of workers. Um, there are more, um, you know, people who can, for farms that can house migrant workers for weeks or, or months at a time, um, and less so smaller farms that just need, um, you know, people for a day or two of harvest. Um, so they, uh, a lot of those areas have seen um, the rates, the day rates for these people go up by quite a bit and ha have had a hard time. There was one village um, in, south, in the southeastern part of the country that was jumping through major hoops to get um, some Vietnamese workers through a sister relationship they have with a town in Vietnam um, to come pick their peppers. Um, and they, you know, a lot of the migrant workers, they, it's the 14 day quarantine that's required in South Korea at the moment is, is, a, um, is both, a, you know, time and also cost, um, you know, uh, like uh, prohibitive costs because it's, it's about um, $80 a day. So this town had um, set up, uh, you know, they, they were going to, they found a, a place where these workers could quarantine for 14 days. It was about 370 workers. Um, there was some resistance from people who lived around this facility. Um, they jumped through all these hoops to try to get it set up. And then ultimately they weren't successful because they um, because they couldn't find the return flights for these workers after, um, after that uh, the work was over. So it's, it's been challenging for a lot of rural areas.
Um, Elaine Baxter is wondering about um, your relationship with Korean government sources or with the US Embassy. Um, how much access do you have to sources there? And do you feel like people are able to be candid with you when you talk with them? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that I can really speak to the can their candidness. Um, the way uh, the reporting structure is set up here in South Korea, um, it is a lot like DC um, in that it's it's very sort of ministry based. A lot of the um, so the Blue House here has a press corps. The Foreign Ministry has a press corps. The Defense Ministry has has a press corps. And if you're a reporter for a South Korean news organization. Um, reporting on one of these ministries, you will, um, your daily commute will be to that press room. Like you will go um, sort of, um, you know, your, your daily commute will be to the defense ministry press room. And then like, you will get to know all the, the reporters there and the people who are in charge of handling the, the ministry people who are ha handling um, the reporters there. Um, and that does, I think sometimes lead to, well, it's usually a lot of like meals and drinking. Um, and then some background conversations there, which and that system does make it a bit tougher for um, foreign cor correspondents like myself in that, um, you know, because we cover the entire country, <laughs> we can't um, spend as much time going to, to one ministry. Um, but uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier, being a metro reporter, like my preference is to spend less time with people who wear official hats and more to people who, whose lives may be impacted by whatever it is issue that I'm wondering about. Um, so uh, I don't know if that really answers your question. And um, I don't know that I really know how candid um, they can be with me, but I do think it is a, it is in, in some ways a challenging environment. And yet at the same time, um, there, a lot of the, um, reporters who have recently been had to leave Beijing because um, the foreign correspondents who've, for American newspapers who've had to leave Beijing have come here. So um, listening to their stories and their experiences seems pretty great. <laughs> to, so it's all, it's all relative. All right, we have a couple of foreign policy related questions. Um, so uh, recently, I think in the last maybe 10 years or so, there's been a lot of concern about Korea leaning maybe more towards China and away from the US. Um, do you think that uh, uh, David Roden is wondering if you think um, younger, younger Koreans think they would be better off leaning towards China? Are they still, you know, on board with the US-Korea alliance? I think that um, the sense that I get from uh, talking to some young people um, and also sort of getting the general sense through um, social media or through uh, public media is, I think the problem with the younger people here is the indifference. I, I would imagine that more so than saying we should lean towards the US or lean towards China, the, the larger part just doesn't care. Like, or like they're, they're too busy caring about um, their job security or they, their daily lives to even even begin thinking about foreign policy or um, consume news in a way that would lead to them caring. Um, so in terms of the younger generation, I, I think it's kind of tough for me to say um, what, what, if you polled them, what their foreign policy um, bent would be. But I do remember, um, I covered the um, 2018 um, uh, summit in Singapore between um, Trump and Kim Jong Un, the first one. And I remember I came to Seoul after afterwards, and I was trying to talk to people um, who had, you know, who had strong thoughts about it, who had paid attention to it. And I went to a bookstore, and I was, you know, there was a North Korea section. And I was seeing who was at the North Korea section, and I was there for, I don't know, good two, three hours and I didn't, I saw one person um, look at a book or pick up a book in that section. Um, and I believe he was in his seventies um, and everybody like, and I think next to it was a book, was a section that had um, sort of, uh, you know, um, exam prep for civil service exams or like, you know, had how to, you know, invest in Bitcoin and stuff like that. And there were, 
there were so many more people in that section. And I think that um, scene kind of sort of drove home for me just how little um, in some ways um, people um, spend their daily lives here um, thinking about foreign policy. So that actually leads into this next question really well from Pat. Um, you had mentioned, you know, this roller coaster that North, the South North relations were kind of going on for a while there. Um, what's the status right now? And and if I can add my kind of follow up is, you know, where do you see it going in the near future? Like, do you see opening for more engagement? Well, if I knew that, uh, it's the situation is that it's it's been frozen. And I think it's, um, uh, I think the South Korean government very much wants to do what it can, what what little it can without running afoul um, the international sanctions that are on North Korea and has most, for the most part, been rebuffed by North Korea. Like, I think the way in which that it happened, I guess most dramatically and visibly um, was when they blew up the liaison office a couple of months ago. This is, you know, snazzy new building that was uh, built by South Korea on North Korean soil um, a few years ago, or in 2018. Um, and it was staffed by, um, you know, there was a floor that was used by South Koreans, um, a floor that was used by North Koreans, um, and it was supposed to be, you know, a physical place where they could meet at any point and they made a dramatic show of blowing it up. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, largely how, how it's been going. <laughs> um, and the, the recent um, episode where a, a South Korean official um, ended up in North Korean waters and, and was um, shot dead was did, definitely did not help things and it um and it's you know it's a situation where there's a lot a lot that's murky and that's um uh in dispute about it but uh i think it's been it's still in the essentially been in a um frustrated uh you know um intractable place for some time and whether that's going to turn around i don't i don't i mean i guess the US elections are the only thing that um, would potentially lead to a change, whatever that is, um, I would imagine. And there's always, um, I think there's been talk since the beginning of the year that um, as it gets closer to the elections and or like, um, and even after the elections into the new year, um, there may be provocations from North Korea, but it's, it's, it's always a, bit of a guessing game. So once again, you're forecasting the questions. <laughs> um, Steven Che has a question about the election and whether um, the Korean people in general are showing any preference of who they would prefer to, to win the US uh, election and, and why. Um, if, there, if there have been polls about that, I haven't seen it. So I couldn't really speak to that. Um, I, I honestly, couldn't say. Um, I, I think it's so. I, I wrote a story, um, I think last year, about how bizarre um, the the Trump engagement towards North Korea has been for the South Korean left and right, and that like things were all turned around because the um, the people that are traditionally for a stronger alliance with the U.S. were all of a sudden with a president who was being very uh, warm towards North Korea and exchanging love letters with with Kim Jong-un um, and then you know the people who are um, sort of against who were traditionally sort of against U.S. troops being stationed in South Korea and sort of against U.S. influence um, in South Korean domestic policy um, all of a sudden had a you know Trump's you know engagement with North Korea aligned with um, aligned with uh, their push toward always towards um, more engagement. So that had just kind of twisted alliances or um, twisted interests. And, and I think that still probably remains largely confused. Um, I think if uh, in terms of, yeah, I, so I think it is kind of tough to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but I, I should look to see if there, there are poll numbers or anything like that. Um, Kevin Quinn is wondering about um, vaccine development for COVID right now. Um, do you know if there's any developers doing like phase three trials with um, volunteers right now in Korea or what's the status of like vaccine development? Um, I, I can't really, I don't really know at the moment, so I can't really speak to that, um, but I don't think so, but yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, so uh, Dan Strickland is wondering, wondering about Chuseok this year. Obviously it was, you know, um, there's a little bit of a, a turn in recent years um, for the younger generation to not observe traditional holidays as much. Um, and then Chuseok this year, obviously the government was trying to stop people from gathering. So what what was the like mood around Chuseok this year? Yeah, well, I mean, the um, the roadways were less uh, traffic-y than they are normally. I think the train tickets, it was possible to get train tickets, which is a rarity um, in, over Chuseok. But I do think it is one of those things that, um, you know, like, um, as I mentioned, that it's accelerating things that were already happening, um, that already a lot of these traditional family ties are fraying and it um, a lot of, um, especially um, women, um, do feel like the traditions surrounding the holiday and how the cooking is done or how, how things are prepared are, are very patriarchal. Um, and there had been people prior to this who had been boycotting it or like choosing not to do it or celebrate it in different ways. Um, and I think this in uh, the this holiday um, in many ways um, sort of furthered that development that was already happening. Um, so I, there were some, the government for, for weeks ahead of time um, was, you know, trying to encourage people to do all, some of the traditional things um, remotely, like like virtual traditions, like virtual um, tade is a ceremony that you have during Chuseok, um, and also like paying people to go um, weed your ancestors' graves as opposed to going yourself and so, things like that. I it's it's tough to say how much that's caught on. I think people because um, it you know rather than doing it virtually, there are probably a lot of people who just didn't do it or um, just set it aside. I think a lot of people went traveling too. There's that. All right, so we have one more foreign policy question this time about Japan. Um, so the relationship between South Korea and Japan has obviously been really um, difficult the last few years. Um, what, what uh, Charles Sherlin is wondering, what will it take for relations to improve? And then if I can also add, you know, we have a new prime minister in Japan. Um, I don't know if you've been covering that at all, you know, the relationship, but you know, how it, would that maybe make a difference? I, I, I think that is a question that a lot of people would like the answer to how, how to solve the Korea, Japan situation. And as with a lot of foreign policy, it, it does, um, Think often come down a lot more to domestic policy than for, domestic audience than foreign policy, um, and I I um, I can't really speak to the future, but I don't know that I see signs that um, it will improve in the near future. I I mean I I do think the where um, that in that should have um, driven home um, what's to be gained by good a good relationship, um, and yet at the same time I don't know that it really did do that have that effect. So um, it still I mean it's not something that I've reported on recently, but it still feels um, largely intractable as it was before. Um, all right, we have about five minutes. Right, we have about five so, minutes. Oh, is there an echo? Okay. Sorry, I heard myself for a second there. Okay, we have about five minutes left. Um, so if there's any final questions, please put them in the chat. But um, Cheryl Davis is wondering if you have any insight on the BTS China issue that everyone is talking about <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, I well, if if by insight do do I. Um, if you mean, do I know what like the Chinese public is thinking? I think it's kind of hard to say, but I, it is, um, uh, it, it's sort of an interesting, I guess, um, thought experiment or uh, 
because a lot of um, South Korea's uh, you know entertainment industry has been very beholden to China um, for the past decade plus, uh, both in terms of like audience, just the sheer number of um, fans and audiences that you can get for television dramas, movies, um, entertainment, uh, pop, uh, you know, K-pop, um, and including video games, like the video game industry was, um, is like hugely impacted by relations with China. And, uh, you know, it, I think there is a sense that um, perhaps BTS might be the exception in that like they, their, their global standing is, is such that they can't be like their um, Chinese fans won't be the end all be all for, for their fate. Um, so, and, and it was, um, and it was so indirect in many ways that, you know, so it, it I think it's an interesting test for K-pop and for Korean entertainment and its relationship with China, um, which is going to be an ongoing issue. Do you have any sense of how the Korean public, like, is this a big, I assume it's a big news story, right? How, how they're responding to this? Um, I, I think it depends on whether you mean the fandom, you know, and you can, you can see how they would feel about it um, versus, I, I think the general Korean public's um, views on China have majorly changed over the past few years, um, definitely since the, the Thad missile crisis um, here. Um, and, and there, I think there is a lot of um, wariness and, and uh, I guess trepidation over just how how thing how rapidly um, things can be changed overnight, um, depending on um, the Chinese government or the Chinese public's um, view of things. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's a lot of um, I guess cautiousness or um, worry. All right. So I, I think we'll wrap up here if that's okay. And um, I really want to thank Victoria for spending her time and, and answering all your questions. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, stay tuned. We'll hopefully have another webinar to announce for you soon. Um, so if you could join me in thanking Victoria um, for her, her great insight. <laughs>